we think of the British Empire as a world spanning power. Uh, and it was in the 18th century, the British conquered much of North America and the islands of the Caribbean. And in the late 19th century, they swept across Africa and South Asia. But in between, the British Empire was actually uh, frequently in retreat. Empire, after all, is an expensive thing. And in some places, it was unprofitable. In the mid 19th century, in the 1850s and 1860s, one of those unprofitable places was West Africa. Now the British empire here consisted of only a few small territories and, and port towns and forts. During the era of the Atlantic slave trade, when the British were the world's great slave traders, these had been profitable positions. But by the 1860s, they were just expensive and didn't make much money for British merchants and didn't make much taxes for the British crown. So in 1865, the British parliament, the governing body of the British empire, convened a committee. You can think of it like a congressional committee to decide what to do with those small colonies. As this document describes, the committee ultimately decided to recommend a gradual withdrawal from West Africa over about the course of a decade, recommending in fact, the end of Britain's West African colonies. And yet, Eight years later, in 1873 and 1874, a British army was pushing deep into the Gold Coast region of West Africa, fighting a large and powerful state, the Asante Confederation, in a war for control of the region, a control that ultimately led to the vast British Gold Coast colony, and soon after, in the 1880s and 1890s, a host of other colonies in West Africa. What had changed in between? Why did the British go from thinking about pulling out of West Africa to pushing forward and northward into carving out new colonial territories? The answer is industrialization. Of course, the industrial revolution in Britain predates this period quite a bit. If we wanted to do a careful chronology, we would in fact argue that British industrialization starts in the 18th century, almost a hundred years before this invasion and creation of the Gold Coast colony. But really it's only in the 1860s and 1870s that Britain reaches its full and vast industrial potential. Over this century, the number of factories, the percentage of the population living in cities, the number of people working shifts rather than working on farms, the number of mines, the amount of uh, coal and, and, and textiles and steel produced rises dramatically. And this industrialization, of course, drives a huge demand for lots of raw materials, lots of stuff, raw stuff to process in factories and to turn into other stuff, finished products that they could sell to their own population and people elsewhere in the world. Now, in the early decades of the Industrial Revolution, most of this stuff came from Britain or from North America or from uh, far-flung colonies, and very little of it came from West Africa. West Africa's contribution to the British industrialization largely took the form of enslaved people taken to the Caribbean or the Americas to help produce those raw materials. But in the 1860s and 1870s, West Africa was beginning to produce lots of material that met three slightly different needs for an industrializing Britain. And I want to tell you about those first three needs that West Africa was meeting because they all come from the same product and that product is oil. So first of all, we can say that all of these factories that you see on your screens needed not just raw materials to feed in, they also needed stuff to stay lubricated and moving and working. And the stuff that they needed was oil. Just like oil keeps your car's engine working, it kept all those factory machines working in the 19th century. And oil was in short supply. The second thing that was needed was soap. You see, industrial machines were dirty. Factories were mostly coal fired and coal makes soot and soot makes dirt and industrial societies need to clean themselves of all that industrial dirt. 
So like the soap produced by this factory, John Knight and Sons factory, the Silvertone Town uh, Soap Works, all of that soap needed ingredients. And the ingredient that it needed more than anything was again, oil. Oils and fats are an important component of soap, especially in this period. And finally, of course, workers needed lights. And in fact, cities needed lights, right? This was a period in which cities like London and Manchester and Birmingham are being lit up by outdoor lamps. But those outdoor lamps didn't run on electricity, not yet. They ran on oil and oil was in short supply. People didn't really know yet how to get it from the ground as petroleum, the way that we do now, or as natural gas, all of that technology would come. Oil could be taken from whales, of course, and this is the big period of whaling, but whales were scarce and getting scarcer. So again, there was a, a big search for oil for lights as well. And British companies looking for sources of oil, for soap, for lubricants, for lighting, found it in West Africa. And this oil was palm oil. So here we see a little representation of palm oil imported to the UK, almost exclusively in this period from West Africa, from the Gold Coast, from what would be today Nigeria as well. And you see that in 1817, the value of the palm oil imported to the UK was pretty small, about 58,000 British pounds. That's 58,000 in, in the British currency. Um, and then it doubled and doubled again and doubled again and doubled again. And by 1854, we were looking at 30 times the amount of palm oil being imported. 1.755 million pounds of palm oil coming into the country. West African merchants were adapting rapidly. West African farmers saw that the British had this huge demand for palm oil and they quickly developed new techniques, new ways of getting that palm oil. They grew more uh, in their palm oil trees. They found new ways to extract the palm oil from the fruit in which it resided. Uh, they found new ways to get labor together to do this work. Uh, most of the work was done by women. Most of the profit in this period was taken by men, but that wasn't that different from factories in Britain where things were in many cases much the same. But so far so good, right? The British needed palm oil. African farmers and African merchants were willing to produce palm oil. Everything should work out fine, right? But there was a fly in the ointment uh, and that fly can be shown in this chart, but I have to explain this chart. The chart shows a period uh, across the x-axis of 180 years between 1760 and 1940. In the early period of this chart, there's no colonialism. And in the later periods of this chart, we see colonialism. And as you'll see, uh, this chart shows a blue line that's generally pretty low, but goes up a little bit and comes back down. On the y-axis, we see numbers from zero to 140. These numbers are showing who is benefiting from trade between Europeans, including the British, uh, and Africans, uh, including those palm oil merchants on the Gold Coast. When the number is low, uh, below about 100, most of the profit is going to Europeans. But when the number goes higher, when that blue line goes up, we see the Africans actually benefiting more from this trade taking most of the profit in it. Now, at the beginning of this chart, we're in the late years of the Atlantic slave trade. Europeans are making lots of money off of trading and enslaved humans from Africa, and the number is low. But when we start going to 1850 and 1860, we see that blue line rising, meaning that Africans are making more and more of the profits. And in fact, a lot of that profit is in terms of palm oil. So while it's true that in this period, in the 1860s and 1870s, the British could get the palm oil they needed from African producers, they were paying more and more and more for it. And that wasn't something obviously that they wanted to happen. They wanted those prices to go down. Now, why were the British paying more for this palm oil? 
Well, the big reason is they didn't control the palm oil plantations where all this stuff was being grown. You see, if you look at this map of the Gold Coast, what you'll see is a bunch of European forts and positions along the coast. In the 1850s, they included the Danish, the Dutch, and the British. By the 1860s, the Danish would pull out. And late in the 1860s, early in the 1870s, the Dutch would also pull out as well, leaving the British as the only people on the coast. But they just controlled little bits of territory and not the places where the palm oil was being grown, shown here uh, as uh, light blue sort of circles. Who controlled that territory? Well, Africans controlled it, and that's why they could raise prices. And the people who really controlled this territory were the Asante Confederation. Now, the Asante Confederation was a state about the size of Great Britain. It had begun in the 18th century when five principalities had come together, uh, had confederated, which is why it's called the Confederation, uh, under a single ruler. Um, and they are represented by that orange space in the middle of the map. And then over the course of the 19th century, they had spread out, taken more territory to the degree where the Europeans on the coast, other than the British at least, even paid rent for the properties, the, the, the little forts that they controlled. The Asante were sort of all powerful, it's a well-organized, highly centralized state. Uh, it was an effective military power and it had a really good budget because it uh, sold a lot of goods, including, of course, the palm oil that got taxed and that was sold to the British. So the British faced really this really big power um, that controlled, among other things, the price of palm oil. And so it's almost not a surprise that in 1873, despite eight years earlier thinking they would pull out of the coast entirely, the British invaded this territory and began to push forward. The British troops, uh, as you can see in this image, were actually mostly black troops. They had been brought mainly from the Caribbean territories of the British Empire. Uh, they had mainly white officers. They pushed northward in this, in this war. And while the Asante were relatively modern uh, in their weaponry, uh, they had muskets, um, they were well armed. The British had the most modern rifles, even sort of prototype machine guns, and they managed to use that industrial technology, so there's industrialization again, to win this war. So by 1874, then, the British controlled most of those palm oil plantations. And in 1901, they would go on to conquer Asante itself. In the years that followed and into the First World War, they conquered the rest of the territory of what then became the British Gold Coast colony and would remain a British colony until 1957 when it won its independence as the state of Ghana. But what happened in between is interesting to see. So here's this chart again. And what I want you to see on this chart is that after colonialism begins, after the 1870s and the 1880s, that blue line goes down again the price of palm oil goes down, the profits that African traders were making goes down, while the profits that Europeans were making goes up. Now, am I saying that the colonization of the Gold Coast was purely a result of the Industrial Revolution and Britain's industrial needs? Well, kinda, um, but I'll admit it's a lot more complex than that. Colonialism happens for a lot of reasons. Uh, we have to think about nationalism. We have to think about the civilizing mission and this belief in civilization and that they have the best civilization. We have to think about racism. We have to think about Europeans competing against each other. But this industrial need for raw materials, for things like oil in order to have lights, in order to produce soap, in order to keep the machines running, that played a huge role in colonialism. And by looking at the relationship between Britain and the Gold Coast in this period, and by looking at the terms of trade uh, and the economics of the situation, we can get a pretty good picture of how industrialization had as one of its consequences, colonialism. <laughs>
Thank you very much.